Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode. The title is The Events That Make Us Who We Are. And really, I mean, I was kind of debating whether I should start the episode off with a quote tunnel. But I'm going to say a few things, then I'm going to dive into the quote tunnel. <clears throat> you see, every human being is a design that is conscious of its design. Now, when you look at what like constitutes a human being, it is what is happening behind their eyes, we can say, and what is happening in front of their eyes. In front of your eyes, life is happening for a character in a story. It is, in some sense, a game of an individual. So in front of your eyes, life happens as character in world, self in world. And that means that you are, let's say, just, <clears throat> just so we give it a number, 50% your environment and 50% your inner environment. Now, behind your eyes is very different. Behind your eyes, the inner realms, it, they're evocational. There are certain unconditional properties of envisionment. <clears throat> but in the outer realms, we, experiencing our, we experience ourselves kind of moving forth. And so life happens. I mean, what is it? It's like what the human being wakes up and goes through a series of a sequence of decisions. You know, certain actions. So that means we experience the phenomena in front of our eyes as events, as incidents where there is a self and there is a world and there's stuff happening. Either the self is moving or the world is moving or they're both moving simultaneously. <clears throat> so the events that make our life, really if we were to kind of look at it, is the decisions we have made in our conscious waking state that have shaped the identity, you know? It's kind of, isn't it strange, like, we are never just one archetype, even Carl Jung spoke about it, there being so many archetypes in the unconscious. It's kind of like the concept of archetypes is playfully kind of like, I would say the concept of meridians in um, Qigong, how your body has endless meridians in it. But anyways, in front of your eyes, <clears throat> you're a character in a world, certain amount of the thoughts that are arise are from the world. For example, you listening to my talk right now, these are thoughts arising from your experience of your world. And there are certain thoughts that arise from your inner realms and your inner realms, it feels like the attention moves the form. So in front of my eyes, I could just see see that tree, but I can close my eyes and envision that tree growing towards the heavens, growing just beyond the clouds, you know? So, so behind our eyes, it's not just normal. <laughs> it's like normality is in front of our eyes. Behind our eyes, nothing is normal. <laughs> Now, to speak of life as an event is a bold move. Some people have done it. Many people have actually. For example, Shakespeare, you know, his plays kind of made us see, get an insight into the human nature for the time that they were. You know, like people look at Shakespeare now and they're like, what is this? You know, but back in the day for the time Shakespeare alive, it was like some next level creativity being kind of thrown. So, but anyways, it was as if life is like a play. And even in Vedic culture, they have this term, they call it Leela. That means whether you're a scientist, you know, uh, a religious person, a spiritual person, philosopher, whatever, you know, you're, you're eventually going to identify some game and that's the event. 
that means you can feel like you can actually be an actor and kind of uh, get out of character when you leave set or you can see every human being is being an actor and when they die they leave set they leave the earth set you know how how they how the conscious experience is set here In a secular way, life is a play of the elements and the forces of nature. <clears throat> Here's the thing. For example, uh, let's say the scientist lets the world set the game. The religious person lets God set the game. The mystic walks towards the unknown. <clears throat> Sometimes when I look back at my life, I'm like, what is this? Is it just events? Alright guys, let's get back to it. Pretty much in front of your eyes again, life life appears as an event. There's this concept called Leela and it's kind of like we're actors in this divine play as if we're two-dimensional actors, but reality is like three-dimensional. And so as long as we think we're two-dimensional, we can't see the three-dimensional. And sometimes I feel that's like materialism is kind of being like, I only want to see it now. It's like, what if the proof cannot be experienced unless you take a, a step, an unknown step. The spirit of the unknown has been tossed around throughout the years, you know. It has tried to be owned by any idea, by every idea. But I feel only the wise ones of this world realize really how hollow it is and how life is not just uh, a conceptual comfort, it is an experience. It is the roar of the breath in a mind that can choose. <clears throat> I look at my own life and I wonder, how did I become this person? And I realize on some level, I never knew I would be this person. On another level, I, I always knew I would be this person. And it's kind of like both brain hemispheres are attempting an answer. Only to know, to discover that the frontal lobe holds the secret. Ladies and gentlemen of Gaia, of Earth. 
what if it was meaningless and you had to create your own meaning? What if nature's mysteries were left as a surprise? What if man uh, attempted to open his eyes when he thought they were open? You know something, I, I don't know how many people do this, but I've done this where I've wondered how well I can remember. And some memories, I remember them, but if I choose to move in the memory, what does that mean, moving in the memory? That means uh, it's like you remembering your last birthday, but then imagining yourself moving in that memory. So it's like in your imagination, you are stretching that imagination with the effort from now. You see, <clears throat> what people say is imagination and what they say is memory is actually happening in the same place. And it is this narrow filter of a certain pattern we recognize that really is the veil between the two. That means sometimes I looked at life and I was like, what, what was everything before everything was everything? And I realized there's this silent gap. There's this unknown, there's like blanks when you look at this world, like a very obvious blank is a black hole in space. It's like, what is that? You know, are we not concerned there's a black hole? <laughs> You know, there's even a theory, like it, people feel potentially the center of the universe, because we can never know how big the center of the universe is, really. Some people feel the whole universe is spinning around the black hole, you know. Okay, guys, so something interesting. I'm surprised someone has brought it up. In the chat section, Hunk says, visualize your thought palace. Now, out of curiosity, how many people listening know what a thought palace is? Wait, let me see how many people are listening first. Okay, only three people are listening. <laughs> all right, all right, okay. So a thought palace is, okay, so imagine you wanted to memorize a deck of cards and you found the person who knew how to, mem who, who knew how to memorize a deck of cards and you asked them, how do you do it, man? How do you memorize this deck of cards? You know, I personally haven't done it, but I could memorize maybe like, I don't know, maybe like 20 cards, you know. <clears throat> But, <laughs> a thought palace is pretty much this idea that the things you remember are things that are kind of pushed, into, pushed towards your long-term memory. And so the more abstract they are and the more consciously engaged you are with how they're abstract, you remember. So the way somebody memorizes a deck of cards, for example, is that they remember, like imagine a building you, were, you grew up in, you know? Uh, <laughs> imagine like, a, what do you call it? Imagine like a house you were raised in, all right? So you know all the rooms and all the places of that house. So the way you would memorize it is you would imagine yourself walking from your bedroom and in your, like here, imagine somebody told you a grocery list of like, I don't know, an apple, uh, uh, a shoehorn, <laughs> uh, a pencil, I don't know, like whatever. They gave you a random list. So what you would do if you were trying this uh, kind of like thought palace method in its more advanced stages, it would be like kind of remembering a city. <clears throat> uh, 
but anyways what what it is is that the person for example imagine the first item on the list is apple so you visualize a giant apple like just on your bed so that way it, it gets ingrained in the long term when it's odd when it's strange you know and then you imagine yourself walking to for example i don't know whatever place there is you know your hallway and then you imagine like the next thing on the thing was a shoehorn you imagine for example 10 shoehorns hovering in the air kind of going up and down so the more you uh let's say abstracticize it i don't know if that's even a people acknowledge that word but they should <laughs> you know the more abstract it becomes uh, the more memorable it becomes. And it's not just that the abstraction, it's not just like you imagine the thing being big, it's the oddness of the situation. And so you would eventually imagine yourself walking through all your house with all these objects happening in weird ways. And eventually, I'm not even joking, if you do this properly, you can even remember the list backwards. You can at any moment remember where what is where in the house, you know? I personally sat down and tried this a couple times, guys. After, but this is not the ultimate. This is just something like it's it's a technique. My 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 recommendation is that you don't have you don't need techniques like that. You got to find the rhythm of your mind. When you find your rhythm, uh, believe it or not, your blessings kind of uh, are internally authorized in that rhythm. Think of it this way. Think of it this way that you have a unique DNA. So if you were in a unique state of mind, it would be a hundred percent activation of the DNA. <clears throat> I mean, isn't that an interesting idea that we should like our DNA? There is potential. You know, this is a strange view, but guys, I'm not joking. I feel there are incredible dormant energies in the body. I don't know why, I don't know why, but I think it's, I, I, I don't know how, but it, it's like there's reserves, you know, it's kind of, I'll give you an example. So for example, we entertained the Bhagavad Gita, in the Bhagavad Gita they saw, uh, they use this metaphor pretty much for mind, body, soul or whatever, the, the way they used it was that the body is the horse's the chariot driver is the mind and the soul is the one who's sitting in the chariot hidden from the chariot driver and so it's kind of like when you when the horses get tired you know or let's say the horses you lose control of them the chariot driver comes has to maintain control but if your mind loses control then there's the saying that in some sense the soul kind of sets in now there is this whole for example those people who are familiar with terence mckenna the scholar his work um <coughs> excuse me he speaks of this rare sort of metaphysics that is that was for the native shamans and in this metaphysics, there is a chemical interaction, you know? It's like, I could tell you sh shamanism is the most spiritual thing that can happen to food. <laughs> you know? But, but, <coughs> but, it is like enlightenment for food. <laughs> But what I mean is, is the idea is that, for example, Terence McKenna in one of his talks, he was saying that, if, I don't know, this, this, he gave mushrooms to this Buddhist monk. <laughs> he did something, you know, intense uh, uh, to that level. And the Buddhist monk kind of threw a towel on his head and just went into meditation. And after a while, looked at Terence McKenna and said, that's the lesser lights. Now, I, I wanted to kind of attempt to explain why that could be the lesser lights because it is literally uh, the chariot driver causing the chariot driver to lose sight of the body and then the intervention of the soul is a has to, but the soul will not intervene in a happy way, you know? That means the chariot driver wants to sit in the chariot, okay? But sorry, not the chariot driver. The 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 one who's in the chariot, the soul that's the metaphor of the soul that's in the chariot. Uh, it <clears throat> it wants a smooth ride, okay. But if the mind, if the chariot driver loses control, the chariot, the person, the soul in the chariot has to step out. 
And that's kind of what I'm saying. That's how they are the lesser lights because it it's out of in it's out of um, a pushback. It's out of a pushback where where the uh, revelation, the mystical revelation, may arise. You know. So anyways, guys, I'm going to read um, something for you. And this is a quote tunnel, pretty much a quote tunnel. I read a bunch of quotes relating to a certain theme or a person in history. So I'm going to read for you how the word event has uh, stepped out of people's inner realms throughout history. Ralph Waldo Evers Everson. <clears throat> a chief event of life is the day in which we have encountered a mind that startled us. You know, guys, it's like, I want to tell Ralph Waldo Emerson, it's like, wait until you encounter the mind of the world. That, that will really startle you. Thomas Merton says, every moment and every event of every man's life on earth plants something in his soul. Winston Churchill says, I always avoid prophesizing beforehand because it is a much better policy to prophecy, to prophecy after the event has taken place. Winston Churchill is a comedian. Who knew? Henry Cartier Bresson, he says to me, photography is the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the significance of an event. Antoine de Saint Exupery says, no single event can awaken within us a stranger totally unknown to us. Wait, wait a minute, let me read that again. No single event can awaken within us a stranger totally unknown to us. To live is to be slowly born. It would be a bit too easy if we could go about borrowing ready-made souls. And that's the cool thing about life, guys. I mean, if you were born perfect, there would literally be nothing to do. What would there be that you need to do when you're perfect? So it is our imperfection that makes this uh, sphere in the middle of a vacuum uh, an exciting place to be on, you know? George Orwell says, early in life, I had noticed that no event is ever correctly reported in a newspaper. Sterling K. Brown, there is a time when it was an event for a black person to be on television, where black households would gather around. Oh, you know, Sammy Davis is going to be on All in the Family tonight. Let's go check it out. It was a big, big thing. Guys, this world is so fascinating in all the ways that it exists that after some point you can't judge an endless universe. Zig Ziglar says, remember that failure is an event, not a person. <clears throat> Maria Hornbacher, 
says, it's really interesting to me how all of us can experience the exact same event and yet come away with wildly d disparate interpre interpretations of what happened. We each have totally different ideas of what was said, what was intended, and what really took place. Oprah Winfrey, I believe that every single event in life happens uh, in an opportunity to, cho to choose love over fear. Wow, that's very true. I think that's Oprah Winfrey is giving such a <clears throat> incredible algorithm to life here that in every moment of your life, if you decide love or if you decide fear, it's like if you choose fear, you fail. It's weird, you know? There's something about fear that it's like, even though it's intense and overwhelming, but it's like there's so much more to this life. And it's as if like when sometimes, the you know, it's like imagine the person saw so, uh, the fear came into their mind. But they saw that fear has, you know, a place to go. <laughs> Here has fear has things to do guys, you know <laughs> The fear was busy, you know before we could confront the fear the fear had to go home you know? <laughs> So choose love over fear and you will be victorious as Oprah Winfrey a great commander of television says Stephen Hawking, success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risks. Guys, I don't think many people realize it, but Stephen Hawking had an incredible humor, sense of humor. There was, there's something where he kind of like, John Oliver is like interviewing Stephen Hawking. I think I have the name right. Um, Stephen Hawking and uh, John Oliver says to Stephen Hawking is there when you say there's parallel universes is there a universe where I'm smarter than you and then Stephen Hawking with his computer voice machine says yes but also a universe where you're funny <laughs> <laughs> that, that made Stephen Hawking a legend in my eyes I don't know <clears throat> Elon Musk says the future of hum humanity is going to bif bifurcate in two directions. Either it's going to become multi-planetary or it's going to remain confined to one planet and eventually there's going to be an extinction event. And he's right. You know, we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere. We got to make moves. <laughs> we got to make interstellar moves, guys. You know, the whole species. <laughs>
Guys, I'm going to read a few more quotes and then I'm probably going to end this. Socrates says, not life, but good life is to be chiefly valued. Okay, these are no longer event quotes. <laughs> what else is there? All right, guys, I think we've reached the end of the quote tunnel. Let me read one last quote. Let's see what's the quote we're going to find. And then I'll get back to the talk. Just, I want to finish the quote tunnel. <clears throat> wow, guys, this quote is like next level. It's by David Bailey. He says, all pictures are unnatural. All pictures are sad because they're about dead people. Paintings you don't think of in a special time or with a specific event. With photos, I always think I'm looking at something dead. I mean, that's a bit intense, you know. Maybe the photo keeps the dead alive. <clears throat> All right, let's not end off on that. Let's actually find another. Okay, this is a good quote to maybe say. Edgar Ramirez says, there's no way to reconstruct reality. It happened once. What you do is reinterpret and recreate. Even if you have the person who lived it and did it next to you, the event happened just once. And that's true, guys, because it's, it's like every moment is unique in time. Can you be like who you were 10 years ago? You see, no, your eyes have changed. Your body has changed. Your mind uh, is differently directed. What if life was not a thought? Why, what if every thought was a photo? And we were passing through these photos at speeds unfathomable. What if rather than there being one human being journeying, what if it, one human being journeying through a linearized space and time from past to the present to the future, what if it's an, it's an endless um, projection of design, as if the past is still where it was, you know? The present is still where it is, and the future, it stares with the glory it has already beheld. The events that make us who we are, I think, is a calling towards a new attention to the life of the human being. You know, in reality, you got to become conscious of your mortality. You know, at some point, this show ends. And so while the show is on, while you're an actor on the stage of your consciousness, it's like what performance awaits you? You know, what is, what is life waiting for?
you see, it, we got to be very careful that as we take steps towards uh, an advanced civilization, <coughs> we make sure we don't nullify technologies that could still contribute. Imagine someone, when Einstein was about to write, for example, his essay on super relativity, imagine some new age hippie time traveler ran and was like, Einstein, you don't have an ego, bro. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, ask yourself, who are you? You know, who is the who? And Einstein's like, leave me alone, man, I'm about to change the world. <laughs> and that's the thing. We needed Einstein's ego. Because it, it was a card that it was worth our species seeing. Every person's mind, it's like a card you're dealt, and you can choose to show this card to humanity or to humanity. Yeah. You see, we have, we have caught ourselves with a sort of action. You might not believe it, but most people feel enlightenment is for a person. They think it's like when they reach the edge of it, they feel they're going to be a person with power or ability or something. Not the case. This world is alive and way more ancient than us, and we are the new eyes. So this, the unknown, knows that we don't know. We don't know that we don't know. That's the issue. And when you realize that you don't know, your mind stops constantly in your inner realms framing the world. So you find this strange silence and stillness where attention becomes, like I call it, hyper-attention. That means there has been moments where, certain moments, it happened in sports once. Once we were kind of like I was on a team, uh, we were playing soccer, and <clears throat> the team I was in was suddenly like looked down upon. The other team was trash talking, and our team wasn't trash talking back. Because our team knew we did, like the people didn't have skill, but I had skill in the team. And I remember we lost that game, but I managed to dribble and score. And it was a situation where <clears throat> the ego was pushed. And rather than one getting rid of the ego and judging the push, the push led to the ego bringing more ability of the soul. <clears throat> so the ego is like a tool, really. Identity is a, is a tool for public projection because on some level when you're singing in the shower, why is the person not nervous there? Why are they nervous on stage but not in the shower? So the aim is not to become, uh, every, the whole species becomes so mystical that there is nobody is, uh, is, is like uh, using thoughts. I say you're not a thought but I also speak about it as an advanced technology. Anyways, back to that kind of idea of why it's important to, like it's, it's everybody has that this ability. Just remember like something you did like 10 minutes ago and then keep looking at that memory. And after a time that <clears throat> you close your eyes and you visualize phenomena and you can keep that phenomena in your inner realms, then when your eyes are open, that phenomena can simply stay there. If you're super comfortable with the nature of your inner realms, in your outer realms, the inner realms adjust to the outer realms and it becomes remarkable because that means your imagination is a sort of uh, stretching of reality. So you perceive a stretch reality before the reality, but this stretch of reality is also concerning and it's considering in itself reality before your opinion. So it's I'm kind of saying there's two views you can really kind of have. You know, you can look at this world and think it's completely empty, or you can look at it and see it's completely full. Uh, we realize our minds is what is filling the world with meaning, okay? So it's, it's an oscillation between the two. <clears throat> you can't talk about good without seeing bad. You can't talk about a bad without having a reference for what good is. So you see, it's, it's all kind of being placed and positioned and set in motion. <clears throat> what it is, is I think ideas are our are, are inner realms as, appear as a vacuum uh, for the words of others. 
<clears throat> what does that mean? Uh, not for the words of others, even for your own witnessing capability. I've looked at certain moments of my life and I wondered why did it happen that way? And for a long time there was judgment, analysis, criticism, various ways I thought about my own life. I'm like, okay, maybe I maybe I should be looking at my life in a way that I don't know yet. You know, even that thought came across. But then after a while, you kind of feel like nature is building something and you're just there for the ride. It does feel like that too. That means often when I give these talks, there is a feeling like, you know how you don't think about your heartbeat, it's just beating, so you trust. So you're automatically trusting a lot of nature's processes, your biology and Maybe the mind is alive beyond definition. Guys, out of curiosity for all those people listening and in the chat section, can you, if, if you feel comfortable, share your location and your age? I want to kind of get a sense of the audience, if, if you feel comfortable, though. Anyways, the events, guys, because the, if, the, if, if it's a younger audience, I could use imagery that's more relevant. Okay, okay. So we have a... All right, so I could speak comfortably then, all right. So yeah, all right, let's continue then with the talk. You look at your own life and you see what you have access to. Imagine you were on an island. Imagine right now you're on an island, okay? And that means you technically have to reinvent the, reinvent the wheel. You have to reinvent your own sense of knowing by constant trust in the, this once in a lifetime adventure, believe it or not. Okay, nice. It's always kind of like incredible when people share where they're listening from, you know. I feel there's clues in childhood and in child in memories of one's own childhood of how they have been preparing for the events of life. In the movie Gladiator, there's a scene, I don't know how many people saw it, but there's a scene where before Maximus goes up to see the Emperor, I don't know if it's a deleted scene or not, <clears throat> where his kind of general buddy, I, for, I forget his name, Lucius or something, Lucian or something, the guy comes.
Sorry guys, just a second. Okay. The sounds of society, guys. The sounds of society. <laughs> Guys, just to finish what I was saying, uh, in that scene, uh, Maximus is chained, about to go fight this spoiled emperor, and uh, his kind of like gen soldier buddy kind of comes up to him. He's like, "Maximus, I can get you out of here," and then Maximus smiles and looks at him, and he's tied up, about to confront the king, and he says. Nature never puts one in a situation where they're not prepared for something of that imagery. All right, he says, no, nature never puts you in a situation where you, you, you there is no kind of what do you call it? Nature puts you in situations where it has also prepared you for, and that's kind of how I'm trying to refer to you looking at your own childhood memories about looking at every event that has happened in your life and seeing how nature had made you prepared for that event. So what does that mean? That means we it's like comparing a memory you had when you were 10 and comparing a memory when you had when you were 20, you know? And then wondering how that memory when you were 10 had prepared you for, for, for that memory you had of yourself when you were 20, for example. Ah, I don't know, guys. Life is, uh, what is it? It's like, <laughs> that's though, it's like we got to live life to figure out what life is. It's like, could life be any more, get any more funnier, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, Socrates, before he had to depart from this world, there were people around him, and he told them, it's kind of legendary, and, uh, it's kind of known in philosophy. Uh, Socrates kind of, uh, okay, long story short, um, he was talking about his own kind of view on divinity. And back in the day, people perceived the ancient Greek God, so it deviated from that. So they brought him to court and he had some 
some people were nuisances in his life. And what happened <clears throat> is that he, for the sake of his honor, <clears throat> and based on the instruction of this inner oracle that he said from the beginning of his life, there's this inner oracle with him, Socrates has said this, that this inner oracle in some sense told him where to go, you know. So it would as if like there was this intuition behind his eyes that would authorize his actions or unauthorize it, you know. And so anyways, he decides to go and um, he's sentenced to drink poison. And so he's giving this speech before he kind of passes, departs, and he says, I will either go to a place where there will be no Socrates. These are his famous words, no Socrates, where there is no self. <clears throat> and then he says, or I would go somewhere where all the greatest, the all the answers to all the greatest questions I've ever had in this life will be there, something like of that sort. <clears throat> so that means human beings are in a game of manifestation, oscillating between the known and the unknown, and we are, we have created a language that is based on conscious life so conscious life is the starting ground conscious life we have to in our we have to kind of create a conscious headquarters and then uh, explore and move towards the unconscious you know Guys, there's this talk, this talk I gave, it's talk 438, if I remember correctly, and I'm going to tell you this, this is like a good story to share. <clears throat> I was, um, and really, um, Only's comment kind of reminded me of this. <clears throat> Just a second. So, I was born in Tehran, Iran, and then I moved to Canada and lived in Canada since I was young, you know. And I've been back and forth, and uh, I was visiting in 2016. After going to India, being in Rishikesh, India for two months, afterwards I, I was close to Iran, so I went visited Iran. And so, uh, my family on my father's side, they're all in Iran and whatnot. And I found myself in this event that was being held in this basement area in Iran's a theocratical society. <clears throat> and in this event, it was called like a literally, you know, soul event, spiritual event. Okay, so Erfan in Farsi means kind of spiritual, let's say, the word spiritual. And so it was the spiritual gathering, and it was a bunch of people who all were kind of dressed properly with suits and whatnot. And so it was a series of speakers, and I was there watching. And one by one, they came up and they would int introduce themselves as like, they would, the guy with the microphone would be like, Master, Master Ostad, this guy is going to come and speak about, for example, this and this and this. And so in this whole event, nobody, nobody even got close to talking about what consciousness even is. One of one guy literally came in the spiritual event and was just demonstrating his martial arts ability. <laughs> but anyways, at the end, <clears throat> at the end of it, it was a situation where
my father asked me to speak. He's like, go up and speak. He knew I would give these talks. And he was like, go up and speak. <laughs> very, very serious Persian father style. You know, just do it, go up. Yep. And so <clears throat> I go and hold the microphone and the guy's like, you got 10 minutes, you know. And so I finish the talk in eight. <laughs> but I remember at the end of that talk, and it's in a different language, so people go see going to see that video that it's not in English. I still haven't transcribed it, so uh, mind that. But anyways, in that in that talk, I sit in front of that crowd of people, and I don't know how many people are aware of this, but there's this strange pattern going on in the world where this concept of guru disciple thing can also lead to incredible deception. So this is why I decided that I that no, I only consider advanced communicators and pilots of consciousness, these two terms, you know? And these two terms, none of them are egocentric. <laughs> so you can't, you're not, you can't, you can't, it's like, <clears throat> they are ego proof. <laughs> but, <laughs> But anyways, I was there and I had the microphone and there was an intense moment where I got this, it wasn't like a goosebump feeling, but it was like the cousin of a goosebump feeling. <laughs> it was like this kind of awe, this wondrous moment. And it was the first time I ever held a microphone and gave a talk. And I looked at a room full of people and I said, there is no such thing, you know, as a guru outside of you. And that the only task, the only task of the guru outside, or whatever that idea is meant in history, was to make you aware of the guru within. Because if you weren't aware of the guru within, you would endlessly, you would endlessly follow someone who you will have no idea who they are. That means we're not in this life to look at other people's eyes. We're here to discover the nature of our own eyes. And so it was it was hilarious because it's like like literally twenty people had come up and they each called themselves mad like Ostad, Ostad, and you don't understand because in, in certain countries the idea of guru st student, it's not like teacher student, it's it's literally like worship. It's literally intense ideological deception right <clears throat> so that's the thing we got to be natural beings before we we can handle ideology properly you know any ideology that takes you too far away from your no nature anytime the kind of soul forgets its humanity uh, or let me say it, the mind forgets its humanity the soul roars so I'm telling you it's like there is something, oh, uh, and I forgot to say this. At the end of the talk, I said, <clears throat> your only guru is your moment of being because it has been what has been there from the beginning. And I was like, bam, drop microphone, yeah. And I, I got out of it. <laughs> okay, so we have a comment. Honk in the chat section says. We talk a lot about different ideas, thoughts. What's the relationship of just putting down all ideas when we think we should do it consciously and try not to think unconsciously? You see, when you realize, as Sadhguru in one statement, he kind of penetrated the veil of this question, and he said, the content of your mind is not your choice. That means when somebody says the word apple, that image of an apple that pops up is not your choice. But what is your choice is the discretion and the observance of whatever phenomenology your attention finds. Wield your attention and you will see the Jedi has found something better than a lightsaber that the mind of man is 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 projecting his position this is why i say in zen they would say when you want to climb a mountain start at the top when you live a life attempt the greatest 
because where else would we find a stage this fast? Where else would you find a world where intelligence has progressed this far? The events that make us who we are is the choices that echo into the future. There has to be an incredible advancement of creatures on this earth. We are we have we have waited too long in the bunkers of uh, what the past wants. You know, the, what the past wants is to not be forgotten. That means as long as you honor the past, I think you're fine. But if you let the past define your future, the past is not honoring the future. You see, so you, there has to be a balance. You know, you have to defend. <clears throat> Uh, like any civilization, advanced civilization. Do you know what that means? That means we would feel responsible for people's micro suffering. Right now, we don't feel responsible for people on Earth who are starving to death. But but uh, eventually, an advanced civilization will bloom, where suddenly, imagine that kind of starving child in some kind of bomb-stricken country staring at the world and suddenly a light comes and that light is not the light of chaos it is the light of a new order not an order that is ideological because this world is not built on one idea it becomes believe it or not cancerous when one idea tries to consume all ideas so and that's what I call the language wars that really human beings have been attributed attention present in the moment and phenomenology has been happening around them and their attention as it has gone, as it has consciously opened to that moment sequentially has become the definition of life. <clears throat> you have to look at a piece of paper and realize the opportunity of a lifetime to connect the inner and outer realms consciously. Study your life. Let it be poetry, the poetry that you've been searching for. You know, so, some people may think this is, um, maybe, here, I'll, I'll plant another picture. <clears throat> Imagine uh, your closest, your suddenly, girl, your girlfriend, imagine, had to go to war. Imagine civilization was completely flipped around. Instead of the men who had to go to war, the women had to go. <laughs> so imagine your girlfriend had to go to war, you know? And then there would be that yearning for, is she okay? What is happening? You know, all this, all these thoughts coming. And so it's this, it's this curiosity for how the unknown is treating something that you know. But, but, imagine now just like how much you as a human being can love the continuity of the life in front of your eyes. Imagine one moment where this is where I feel really styled is born. This is where style is born, guys. This is how far I've been able to attempt to kind of perceive the question. It's when you stop wanting the future and you look at the present and you notice the simple and the complexity gets shocked. And there is this sort of void that once you endure and just observe through that void, you realize the ability of this whole style, free will, everything is just freedom of choice. It's not just freedom of choice as in you have freedom to choose. It's freedom of choice. Your choice dictates your freedom. <clears throat> your choices in this civilization imagine society is like this machine you know and we enter this machine and our choice is based on how much aware we are it's like don't forget the concrete jungle it means now you have to be aware of an inner wilderness in psychology it's a very complex situation life 
even though I say when you reach a simple simple observance of it, it does it's no longer complex. But because the states of mind alter, it's very hard to define it. So it's like the one defining it is changing as much as the phenomena they're defining. So what does that mean? That means we're not here to understand per se the nature of reality. We are here for a sort of performance of design. <clears throat> and I'm not sure <clears throat> how, how, how deeply that idea can be accessed because I'm saying that before we are characters in the stories we've been raised in, we are all just witnesses of design. We're all looking at life as a designer. A child that doesn't know any words, doesn't know any ideas, doesn't even know its name, that child is looking at just the world as stuff, as design, as shapes. And so based on the animate phenomenology that happens uh, in the moment, the mind of the being evokes to what is actually real. <clears throat> You know what's funny? The human being looks at the insect and says, look at this insect. And the insect looks at the human being and says, look at this human being. <laughs> <coughs> but both of them are squashed by time. We were both the small in a bigger picture and I think that's what honor is. Honor is when behind your eyes you're engaged with a bigger event. But that event is not per se narrative oriented, it's experientially oriented. You know, guys, this is a good exercise. I think the pe everybody in the chat section should do this. Everybody so far who's I've seen communicate. For a second, ask yourself, who would you be if everything you knew, you had seen and you had known it? Where would you be left after the ultimate knowledge? It's okay to ask that question. And there's no issue of worthiness or unworthiness because if you're conscious to hear me, to hear this idea, you're worthy. Once you have reached a state of being in which you feel that everything you have ever known was just a, a little kind of as if the spotlight of your flashlight just on a little part of the forest <clears throat> and there was so much more and that more constantly destroyed like I can't tell you when the mind envisions something more it, it no longer feels small it's kind of like this is the argument choose the great why not <clears throat> why not uh, experience the quality, the greatest quality of your existence experience? Really?
you know, it's 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 very interesting. You know, this concept of war that when my youth, I was like when I would see films or movies where, like they they would fight with swords or something. I was like, how cool was it that it's like you would be kind of called to the battlefield and you had to go and kind of confront and see who you would be. You know, like I felt there was something incredible about just intensity causing you the inner intensity to also arise. Fear not the hand that you're given. Fear not the sight that you're given. You know, it's like you cannot play an instrument well unless you have accepted the nature of the instrument and you won't comprehend the secrets of your own intelligence or your mind. This once in a lifetime opportunity. It's as if every human being has technically won the lottery. You've won the lottery of trying to solve the mystery of conscious manifestation. <clears throat> There's so much unknown. And that's incredible, you know, because it gives so much room for various initiatives. That means if somebody was like, what do you do on a rock in the middle of nowhere? The answer is very simple, explore. That means if, if some people have said, who do you, like, you know, I remember, I mean, I, I don't think of politics in, 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 in I don't think, I have politics for me is, uh, it's, it's an attempt at something that is so, uh, inefficient that I, I don't want to say inefficient I mean politics is a beautiful domain when you study political science you get this sort of honor for how how many ways man's mind is moved in so, so many sophisticated ways that the human being has engaged with archetypes you know it's like when you look at history it's like it's like this huge film and now we have a chance to be actors in it so I honestly, every day I wake up, uh, the only thing that kind of like always remains is that I realize I'm an, I'm a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity <clears throat> to just communicate with your world and see what is this thing in front of your eyes. You know, that wonder is missing. This is why the educational systems are failing. So James Francis says in the chat section, do you have a method for returning to the inner world or inter guru when the outer world has pulled you out of the al al alignment or perspective? <sighs> you have asked the question that is literally out of this world. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll share what I know. But I'll share it indirectly through something that I told someone once. There was someone I, <clears throat> honestly, I don't remember their name. But uh, I was discussing with her kind of like the difference of how I perceive the idea of being outside of your body. Because I don't know how many people know this, but it's spirituality has had so many denominations, so many ways the concept has branched out in people's minds. <clears throat> but really... It was as if this idea that some people feel there is a soul and they feel there's like this Casper, this ghost that you are, this transmigrating kind of soul thing, right? And, <laughs> and so this transmigrating soul, they give it a personality. So that means the soul could go outside of your body. So right now, imagine like you're at, you could be looking at yourself from... I don't know, three meters in the air above your head. Imagine some idea like this. So so that's what we were discussing. We were kind of like talking about that. And she was saying this notion that she can go out of body. I was saying this notion that because the mind is the moment, you are out of your body all the time. <clears throat> I was telling her you are never inside your body. You know, she was saying, I can go outside of my body. And I was like, what is this I? <laughs> <clears throat> so what I mean by that is 
it, it's it's a they call it self realization James why because it's something there before you were here and when you notice it and you notice it through yourself then it reaches a point where knowledge is pursuing it following trusting its intuition trusting its synchronicity everything that's happening suddenly the known sees it is the unknown moving the knowledge then you become aware of your mind and you'll realize the mind is awareness the body is what moves in awareness so believe it or not for your body your mind is your god the mind is like god to your body but to the mind it is not the mind is not god to itself this is why it's like life is not per se about trying to uh, just transcend the game it's about playing the game and you realize life has to also move that means the greater dimensions of this life have to have to <clears throat> occur um, through atmospheres of compassion they have no choice because without compassion you will not let the un unknown speak and that's when extinction hurries towards us so I would say just <clears throat> <clears throat> take a piece of paper and for a moment in this lifetime wonder what if nobody knew what was going on what would your view be and that is the only I would say that is the fastest route uh, towards your true nature when you uh, take off your jacket and run into the battlefield of us answering the question with your whatever tools that or whatever content in the moment accompanies you into the battlefield of the question because sometimes there is no answer there's it's it's like sometimes the answer is in a different dimension than the question so this the eyes that see the answer no longer see the question's existence because the question has been answered <clears throat> You have to wonder, uh, James, uh, uh, in the chat section, James Francis, I will tell you, you have to wonder you have to wonder who you would be If you opened your eyes and freedom was there first when I think about the future generations you know what it makes me feel it makes me feel this comfort to exert extreme um, concentration towards certain subjective fields because let me tell you this life uh, it's as if there's a movie happening behind your eyes and this movie can only remain behind your eyes or it can be shared now what is the value of sharing only if you have seen the world and you eventually see something in the world that as if you see ahead of it you see Guys, I'm listening, I'm literally listening to a song where I think the person, like, 
uh, was in a, in a farm and they just took out their phone and recorded that sound and they made a song out of it. <laughs> so guys, uh, I'm going to open it up to Q&A pretty much, you know, the events that make us who we are is like how our memories are the alphabet of how our free will speaks. As time moves on. <laughs> so pretty much what I'm saying is it's Q&A time. <laughs> so um, it's going to be very open. I'm going to I'm going to stop putting the timer or whatever. Anybody has a question, share. If there's no more questions, I'll, after a few minutes, I'll turn it off. Guys, but a good question to ask is like how do these talks come across to you you can share um, so I'm not just left in the dark I'm like you know on some level I'm, I'm shouting into the cyberspace void not knowing where my voice goes yeah <laughs> Where's this picture I'm looking for? Okay, there we go. Okay, so James Francis, thanks for tuning in, man. It's, uh, you know, I, I feel it's an honor to exist.
Hey guys, this is just the Q&A period. I'm available if people have questions. I'm just... Honestly, I'm just surfing the web. The web of information of the digital era. <laughs> guys, okay, until people think of questions, I'm going to tell a story. Let me see. What's a story worthy of tonight's briefs? Um... I'll tell you the story of Rosta. <clears throat> okay, so interesting. James Francis says, what is your thoughts on the base mortal emotions of love versus fear? By base, I think you mean like how the emotion is arising because of the person's basically on more mortality on their mortality so you're saying how love and fear realistically they're different Okay, here, I could say about love and fear is that they are huge in, in just the narrative view. That love and fear I don't know what it is. It, it's like I, when I try to look at something to understand it, I wonder, first of all, where is the creature and what are the dimensions of its, how it's internally interpreting reality and what is reality. So I would say love and fear, they are phenomena that occur in the inner realms, really, because atoms can't fear atoms. It is the condition that these atoms that our body is being right now where the mind is telling a story where when external reality deviates too much from our story then we kind of you know there's the narratives of love and fear you know and these words are very deep and heavy words and throughout history they were inspired out of the actions of human beings for example there's a story about napoleon where there's this situation where he's caught in the palace and his brother his brother was like, I think his older brother, <clears throat> was like a nobleman, was like a politician. And so his, his brother suddenly comes in the palace and saves Napoleon from these guards that caught on to him or something, you know. And so <clears throat> that's a moment where you can say that's, that's a sort of relationship with the fear in that moment that imagine you were Napoleon's brother, the fear you had of what could happen and the love you had for Napoleon, both were factors. So it's not just one-sided where you have fear and you have no love or you're, you know, you just love without fear 24 <clears> seven. <throat> these, are, these are ways that we classify. It's pretty much how we layer our inner realms upon the outer realm. But if you want me to, friend James, if you want, if you're asking about a certain thing about love and fear, I could tell you it's like, love is life, fear is death, like the most basic thing. <laughs> you fear there is nothing. It's like, uh, it, it's inefficient. You confront the fear, at least you could find the efficient. If you don't confront the fear, you'll be held back. So you got to kind of think of life as like, again, this known variables and unknown variables. And sometimes the way an unknown variable suddenly becomes known, it can cause fear and it can also cause love. 
you know. But there's certain things in, in, in life that for me, love is not just a concept. It's not like uh, a linear relationship. It's, it, I think at most, <clears throat> it is a calling. Yeah. It's being pulled somewhere, being drawn by something. That means that person who loves cake, <laughs> who loves apple pie, when they see an apple pie, they're being drawn by it. But when they realize sugar stops the organs, they'll be like, okay, all right, this apple pie is a lie. <laughs> but guys, apple pie is nice. If they make apple pie without sugar, definitely eat it. There's something about the sweet that's just the body even knows it's artificial. <laughs> I was going to tell you the story from Persian mythology, from the work of most mythologies around the world. They're the works of poets, even Greek mythology. Um, so Persian mythology, there is this work from Ferdowsi where he shares the story, and uh, I'm not doing this justice. Uh, I got to brush up uh, on my Persian mythology, but I'll tell you this: that uh, I remember a certain level of, with a certain level of accuracy the structure of the story. So I'll tell you. There is this divine warrior, and when I say divine, literally think as if Luke Skywalker level divine, you know, <laughs> where they're like, I don't know, like a level of divinity where the Jedi would be the force is strong. So what does that mean? That means the moment is on the side of this warrior. So Rostam, this man, this undefeatable warrior named Rostam, he is, he's been through many battles and nobody can defeat him because it seems like there's gods watching over him. You know, the gods are watching over him. The story progresses in a way where Rostam, this undefeated warrior, has a child, but he has to suddenly, he's called to war. And so he looks at his child and he gives the child some sort of cloth around, some sort of cloth or, uh, to wear, like around his, what do you call it, around the child's arm. Something to distinguish that it's his child, you know. And he tells the uh, uh, mother to tell the child that always keep it on something like this and then he rostam has to go to battle he's this like massive warrior and so what happens is rostam goes into battle in years and years and it, he goes through so many battles and so many incidents that he it's like as if he's forgotten about his family and his home and everything it's as if the he has left the past behind and so he's this undefeated warrior until one day a warrior steps in front of him that Rostam gets this odd feeling as if there's something strange here. And this warrior just sees Rostam and just charges in fighting where there's no chance even for dialogue and there's this battle that occurs. And in this battle, Rostam is fighting with this fury. And I don't know, maybe there was dialogue. In the, but that's what I need to recheck if there was dialogue before the battle. But in that moment, Rostam begins to see this warrior that has come to challenge him has a strength that's unordinary, a strength he has, he has not seen anywhere else. But it becomes a situation where Rostam eventually hits this mighty blow. He's the divine warrior. He's, he's, the, he's kind of the human being where the gods were like, you are untouchable. <clears throat> and so he, in some sense, uh, he defeats this child, this, this, not child, what is <laughs> He defeats this warrior and suddenly notices that there's this cloth or something and he takes the helmet off and he sees the kids wearing the cloth and it re he realizes it's his own kid. And the moral of that message, especially to all Persian fathers in the universe, <laughs> is that you know don't <laughs> defeat your kid you know
anyways, the, the story is that Rostam realizes he has made a mistake. And so it's a situation where it's like that's the problem with power. After some point, you're, you're going to be recklessly moving in a way where you don't see who you hurt, for example. Even in this show that I've recently been seeing, uh, Vinland Saga, they say a true warrior doesn't need a weapon. That means for the first time in the human mind, there's an elevation that violence, though, is, is like what you gain from violence is so little. It's like once, one, one step of the body is nothing compared to one step of the mind is like a thousand steps of the body. Now when you realize how much we require a gentle enough place for genius to begin its work, eight billion inventors that have been kind of held back by their past, <clears throat> guys I gotta check this just hang in there for a second Maybe this is something I'm not familiar with, base mortal emotions. Let's, let's see, what is this? Oh, the sixth type of basic emotions. Okay, okay, it's just the term they use for it. Guys, so what are the six basic types of emotion? Happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, surprise. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> really? It's just this? What if I, fe I feel fearful and happy at the same time? <laughs> What if I feel surprised and angry at the same time? Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. Here it says combining emotions. So I, <laughs> okay, never mind. Wheel of them. Okay, he's he's seeing it. He's seeing it as a wheel of emotions. Okay, that's it. That's not a bad analogy. So psychologist Robert Plutchik put forth a wheel of emotions that works something like the color wheel. Emotions can be combined to form different feelings. Much like colors can be mixed to create other shades. Okay, no. Okay, this this is I totally had the wrong picture. So this man is literally trying to relate psychology to color, to a color wheel. And if we consider the center of the wheel to be no color, I would agree with this color wheel for emotions. I can see it to be a kind of very valuable model. What if the center of the wheel is, is one of the emotions, that means we feel we can only be angry and we're not experiencing the other emotions, then it's, it's strange, I think. I think it's like the emotion is just whatever consciousness, see, whatever steps in the spotlight of consciousness. <clears throat> Guys, I would appreciate not posting URL links, but if you want to post it, just don't put the www. Just put, post the website with a space or something. Or it's fine, guys. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say, Axel. Yeah, sure. Post the, if it's, if it's, uh, I mean, let's not open it up to everybody posting links, but... <laughs> But sure, Axel, you can post the link, you know. <clears throat> Anyways, guys, Q&A is open. <laughs> okay, so Axel, you can in this episode. <laughs> you can't, oh, okay, so Axel is saying you got to let the base mortal emotions go. Interesting. Give them time, it'll pass. Yeah, you can see his emotions ripples on a pond that you gotta wait to settle. I've had moments where I've kind of, I've had an intensity of an emotion that I've just had to kind of, uh, just set, just be still and have the emotion pass. As if the emotion had kind of disturbed the physiology, so the whole physiology, like a tuning fork, was echoing. And so I had to just be still until there was a sort of. <coughs>
Guys, I'm going to read a poem from this poetry book called I Am Nobody. Like literally the word nobody, but with the space between the zero, uh, not zero, the O and the B. <laughs> so I am nobody. And so I'm going to read you a poem from this. The first poem is called I Am Nobody, and that will be the title. I wrote this in 2016. Some people ask too many questions without realizing it is from their temporalness that eternity is found. The love of creation is always a glance for the creator beyond words. Transcending the ego is the first stepping stone on the path of love's totality. I am not a dervish, but I spin like one. One with capitalized O. The joy of reality is a boundless moment, beyond thought where the past and future cannot be a nuisance. Did you know your real home is not made from bricks, but it is the here and now? Many cats have looked in the eyes of Zen masters and seen a reflection beyond any catastrophe. <laughs> the joy of being is how now we are all seen. I'm going to read one more quote, uh, uh, one more poem that's from under here, like after that. The poem's called, Can Thought Break Itself? Question mark. Can Thought Break Itself? I am being seriously playful. When we wonder who the seer is, we are thrown onto a heaven that can never feel the dirt of the earth. Some wise ones are tremendously judged by others only to see God beyond the mask of ignorance. The greatest wisdom that can be given. Guys, the rest of the quote is not here. There's more to this, Jesus. <laughs> okay guys I'm going to read a quote from another book called Rock Motto just to make sure I read like a complete poem <laughs> the poem is called When Heaven Returns from the poetry book Rock Motto how does the pond throw stones into itself Let's ask man, he might know better, and know is spelled N O. <laughs> we are all the reflections of the divine in our own eyes. How does madness wear a jumpsuit? It is always up to you to dive into a new sky, for what is within you is always beyond you. Could it be that our freedom comes from behind our eyes, not just in front? What if great what if all the things that we want in reality it is just we require to pay attention to how what's in front of our eyes moves what's behind the eyes? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Guys, some of these comments in the chat section are... <laughs> okay, guys. Um, so... Okay, so James says, one more question since Lucky Slumber brought up Aaron Dotti's channel. Do you believe in Law of Attraction? Notice... Ah... Oh. Guys, law of attraction. You should have seen the talk. Like probably you should go hear the talks I was giving, maybe in the two hundred. In the two hundred range. I'll tell you this. <clears throat> this is one thing. This is kind of what I'll tell you. What I'm sure that the law of attraction does, 
is that it attracts a lot of Law of Attraction books. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying that we should be insensitive to the power of mind to intend something and have it manifest. I'm just saying that a sort of blind robotic affirmation in the mirror doesn't help when you have to actually look at life and realize it's more like weather. It's not something you can prepare for it by by uh, by a robotic repetition. It is a living thing. It is like horse riding. The horse is not an object. The horse is a living being. You know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, really returning to the wilderness of nature. This was some, one of my deepest questions even, that could the truth be wild? Could, could it be that because we are animals and we have this genetical memory and at some edge of this genetical memory on that spectrum there's a sort of savageness and could it be that when man reaches his truth it is a confrontation of his animal nature alongside all the civility that there could be? You know, I feel it's like our attention is oscillating between Purusha and Prakriti. So I would say that the law of attraction, if you're not a robot, anything is good. <laughs> Let me tell you the, the thing is like, I know, I know what it is. Like there was a time where I, I looked at the law of attraction and I'm not, I don't want to reduce it. I, I'm just trying to tell you that, um, there's too many more unknown variables and the right approach to the unknown variables is not thinking that you just have to have one thought every day and repeat it and think that you're going to attract what you want. It's about looking at the variables and uh, accessing the direct experience of the information and then deciding and then going forth, you know. So I would say that... Um, I don't believe, first of all, in language, believe it or not. <laughs> People are like, how's this guy talking right now? <laughs> you know, I think all you need in this life it's just like a good look. All you need is a good look at how, at some point, this melody being played on this piano of elements will. Imagine every piano key of the, uh, every piano key was like a element of the periodic table, and like a manifest being was literally like a melody. Some piano player in a higher dimension is playing the elements like a character, <laughs> like a melody. That means imagine in the future, some people are like, yo, is God a piano player? <laughs> I would say that before there is a law of attraction, there is a law of the presence of your attention. If you be if you are aware that it's 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 all an act, then you wouldn't want the emotion. Because think about law of attraction. Why are people going towards it? Because they desire something. They want an image in their inner realms and they want to actualize that image in their inner realms. So they're like, what's the fastest way towards it? But Mr. Within is telling you that instead of you trying to find a super secret technique to get somewhere, you know, it's like, what is it? We're shopping for mystical techniques, you know? <laughs> We're window shopping for mysticism, guys. That's what the world has come to. <laughs> I think this is the most healthiest approach to have towards life. Just think about how your ancestors would look at it, you know, and see what they're missing and be that. That means our ancestors, imagine you were just born in a village and you're like, holy shit, is this civilization? You know, just farm animals and agricultural age and whatnot. And so that person, imagine if you were a child raised in some Eastern mystical culture, it would be the child would be like, what am I? What is the point of this? Why am I a villager boy? 
you know, why isn't there advanced technology? <laughs> and it's when you truly meet the unknown that you realize there is a state that will come in this life where you will have no preparation for. And then you are left with all that you, uh, uh, how well you, you, you looked at your eyes while you were living into it. I feel that um, any action that deviates from your nature comes across as insincere to the inner observer Therefore, its consequence is not authorized. You won't feel you deserve reality if you didn't put an effort for it. You know, it's like, you know, why do some people... <clears throat> I'll tell you the story. This nice story came to my mind. <clears throat> it's the story I, um, uh, my mother told me when I was young, where he told me and my brother when, the, when we were like seven or something. She said there was this... Uh, <clears throat> there was this merchant and back in the day you know and this merchant had a lazy son and told his lazy son what are you doing in the house go go somewhere else you know the child this is very important in child psychology, guys. Anybody who's a parent should, should be listening to this story. The child is doesn't want to step out of the range of its comfort and familiarity. It is told to go out and work. And the father goes to work, comes back, and sees the kid is just sitting on the couch. The, the story is back in the day, guys. Keep this in mind. This is important. And what happens is the mother would be like, oh, poor kid, you know, let me give him some money. So he gives it to his father so the father doesn't yell at him, you know. So the kid would give the money and the father would throw the money into this fireplace they had and the kid wouldn't react. And then every day this would happen. The father would take the coins, the mother would give the kid and would throw them in the fire and they wouldn't react, you know. And so one day the father figures out what the mother is doing and asks her to stop. And then the kid has no choice. And he's kicked out of the house and the kid goes and he sees there's some guy laying bricks. Okay, there's some guy laying bricks. And so the kid's there and the guy suddenly shouts at him, hey kid, throw me that brick. And he just throws a brick, you know. And then the guy says, kid, you want a job? And the kid's like, okay. You know, and then the, after sending the bricks up, the kid goes up on the brick wall and helps the guy build the house. And the whole day he spends helping this guy build the house. And at the end, the guy's like, yo, thanks. He gives him something. The kid comes home exhausted, his eyes opened to levels of experience that are their own gifts. The kid goes home and then the father comes home. And the kid, the father's like, did you make money today, kid? <laughs> For a second, I confused the father as the godfather. <laughs> Anyway, the kid says yes and gives the coins to the father. The father takes the coins and is about to throw it in the fire. And the kid at the speed of lightning just grabs the father hand, father's hands and says don't. You know, and in that moment, the father looks at his son and he says now, now you are a working man. It's really an incredible story. 
because it's suggesting that what you really, the effort you put, uh, will suggest the meaning. So this life doesn't need to be sheltered by ideas. It's 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 it has unknown variables. It's it's going to remain a lot of it is going to remain unknown, and the knowledge our civilization has based on how long history is, it's like literally like a candle has been lit after four billion years, you know. This candle of a conscious human species, and so uh, the events that make us who we are also suggest who we have become, based on our events and where we will go. And so it's as if when you can honor your past, you will be content with the present, and you will find honor in the present, and then you you will honor the future. And when you honor the future, you will feel deep down at your core, this is an okay moment. And then you deserve. But if you don't have deep down that feeling that it's okay, and it's not artificial, it's experiential. This life, this world is alive, guys. Regardless of how much you robotically in the mirror says, say whatever. You know, I, I, I mantras are different because mantras. The whole point is to step out of an ideological perspective. So when you're repeatedly chanting something. It's like, imagine this, imagine you chant something and you get one thought, and then you chant and you get another thought and another idea. And then after a while of just endlessly chanting, I've tried this, endlessly chanting, you're no longer going to be thinking. The chanting, your finger's going to move automatically, and your mind's just endlessly evoking this one image. So it's like, there was this... <clears throat> So I would say no, I don't believe in the law of attraction, but I believe your attention to the laws of both the outer realms is really discovering the nature of the world, is it not? I'm just feeling, guys, imagine in the future aliens come down for extraterrestrial contact and the alien asks us, what is gravity? And we explain gravity and all the aliens start laughing. And we're like, what is this? It's like first alien contact, the aliens are laughing at human beings. How unprofessional, you don't laugh at an alien contact. <laughs> and the aliens laugh and all human beings are like, what the fuck, what the fuck? <laughs> and the aliens laugh because they realize we still haven't comprehended the nature of energy. We're looking at time before we're looking at energy. It's like the, the, when you realize nobody has your eyes, what else are you, do you need? Like, I don't even understand why people go to psychologists. I mean, I can understand why certain people would go to psychologists, but I'm saying, like, on some level, it's like nobody has your eyes, so who can change your life, you know? So be when you become responsible for your sight, then you also start living, believe it or not, your life. And that life is trusting your inner realms when you will know. It's, it's, it's a strange situation. I thought reality was real. It's so surreal, I'm starting to call it surreality, you know? But can you guys fathom we're on a rock? In the middle of nowhere, we're not that close to the sun to burn, and we're not that far to freeze. And so the Earth is at a certain axis, and there's so much life on this planet, so many different species and whatnot.
So guys, somebody shared a link of the emotion and feeling wheel. All right, let's see what this is. Okay, this guy has a colorful view on emotions. <laughs> Okay, so he's classified him as ecstasy, vigilance, rage, loathing, grief, amazement, terror, admiration. He's divided it up into eight. Why eight? <clears throat> Why has he chosen the number eight? So he's dividing. That means he's perceived. Potentially this may be the case, but eight different ways that emotions have potentially communicated. And then he's seen sub-dimensions to these eight emotions. Go. Guys, I'm going to share this picture. Somebody shared this in the chat section, and I thought maybe we should give it attention. So this is, um, it's, it's honestly interesting. I mean, it's definitely an innovative and smart idea. That means, I, I, you know, there's no questioning. It's an intelligent, it's kind of genius when you connect two worlds that had nothing to do with one another. When you connect color and emotion, like that's a genius moment. But I would say that it, it, <clears throat> there's one view on it, yes, that it's divided in these. And there's a way where you see these eight classifications as weather. That means, like, when you're angry, that's the weather, that's the state of mind you're in. These are all responses to events. Emotion is a response to an event. This is a good definition, I think. I just thought of it, but I think it's, it's worthy. So anyways, dear listeners, thank you for tuning in. I feel I must end now. Let's talk. live for life and you will live for life much blessings and honesty